Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, Kanisa introduces us to Yalop P. Yalop of the Palau Conservation Society. Yalop takes us on a driving tour of Palau and tells us about living in this remote Pacific nation. Kanisa and Yalop talk about how the development of Palau has changed it in the 10 years since they've seen each other and what Hawaii can learn from Palauans who share a unique connection to their islands and culture. I first visited Palau in 2005. I had been to teach a science workshop for Palauan teachers. On my trip, I met teachers from throughout the Republic and was fortunate to journey to some of the more remote villages in Palau. My guide, Yalop P. Yalop of the Palau Conservation Society, was a great host, and I was excited to see him again after all these years. I was also interested to see how Palau itself had changed. Relava! Ali, it's so good to meet you. <laughs> and so we're going to go on a travel to Bubble Dog. To Bubble Dog, yeah, let's go. Let's go to Bubble Dog and meet with uh, Alan Olson for the uh, coastal and forest and coastal bird uh, money tree. Yalab drove me from our hotel in Karor across the bridge to the northeastern coast of Bubble Dog Island to meet with Birder. Alan Olson of Palau's Bird Management Program. Alan is going to show me the ropes at birding, how to track these elusive creatures, and he'll also teach me a little about the local birds. When I was here before, um, there was not a road around Babel Dab. No. And so now that the this road has been, been built, right. I imagine things have changed somewhat. Not really changed, but it's just the road inside the big island. Uh huh. Uh, and then the road to the villages have also been paid, so it's more like uh, comfortable <laughs> 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 and not too much sediment going to the ocean. <laughs> oh, sure. Right. Yeah. So it's maybe actually helped the environment to some yeah, extent? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But then there's planning for development, so that's another worry. I was especially interested to see how the construction of the controversial road circling Palau's largest island, Babeldaab, had changed life and the environment in Palau. And the sediment that flows off the land from the activities on land then impacts the, the reefs and the habitat and the water. Right. There's um, uh, little farms that are springing up everywhere. People are cutting forest and uh, uh, planting fruits and vegetables. But you know, interestingly, right now we just uh, reached more than a hundred thousand tourists into Palau a year, wow. and so we're seeing less fruits and less vegetables in the shelves in the stores, the local supermarkets. There's also we cannot buy fish in the local fish market because there's uh, many mouths to feed. <laughs> <laughs> so much demand. So much demand. And um, so the national government is uh, urging people to make uh, local produce, which is good so we can meet the demand. But so that gives us environmental people the challenge that the, they're cutting f forest and then rain comes, there's going to be sediment down to the uh, river and flows out to the reefs. And we have the Environmental Quality Protection Board, we call it EQPB. It's uh, equivalent to the EPA in the States. And uh, they are the compliance agency and uh, they try to cover the whole Palau, but sometimes people don't like them because they try to make people, you know, follow the regulations, to comply with the regulations. And uh, uh, 
uh, they get to be like the bad people so we try to help them we take them out to the radio to explain why we need to comply with the regulations uh, we also invite them to television we have a television show it's like three minute environmental update uh, every week uh, uh -huh. from PCS and uh, also like newsletter but the radio is has been also very effective because it's like 45 minutes sometimes to more than an hour and we talk about the regulations and why we need the regulations and why we need to protect our uh, habitats and for like species that we that are useful to our lives I'd like to ask you about growing up in Palau mm -hmm. and and what was that like Growing up in Palau is it's fun. It was fun, but it's like in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of changes. Like this road has changed; it's, it's expanded, and we used to walk from home to school and school to to home. And uh, I remember when I didn't speak English; I didn't know how to speak English. And we went. We walked from home to Maristela School right up here. There was no school bus. We didn't have backpack. But we, you know, when you grow up in an island, then, then you want to go to the big islands. Sure. You go to Guam, you go like, wow. And then you go to Hawaii, and you go like, wow. And then you go to California, you go like, wow, and a bigger wow. But when you go out, and then when you come back, you appreciate what you have. You, you begin to understand that uh, the big cities in the bigger islands are not as fun as like in Palau where you can just go swimming anytime and uh, we used to go swimming just after school we go swimming we eat um, fruits we climb up coconut or um, mango trees and we are eating along the way uh -huh. to swim and then we come back a little bit late so we get scolded <laughs> but it's and we don't need swimming lessons we just like learn from our friends and then you know almost everybody we have good access to our relatives and friends and you say hi to all the governors when you you meet all 16 governors in in the big in the city center in the center and uh, how you know, many people live in palau the population is like just a little over two twenty thousand uh -huh. twenty thousand and uh, the twenty thousand people who live in palau about how many on bubble down so about like 5,000 live in Babel and then it's like uh, 14,000 are Palawans and then uh, 7,000 are foreigners. I'm amazed by how much you've traveled ar around the world and I'd just like to know, um, maybe you can tell me about your comparisons between places like Palau and then I know you just got back from Kiribati and you spent some time in Hawaii and what do you notice about the the Pacific Islands? So when you're from a small island like Palau and then when you're growing up and you're in high school you just want to go out of Palau you go like ah this is a uh, tired of you know your, ha your home your island and then when you go away and then you see how difficult transportation is, how big the, um, the another island is, and then you cannot contact your your relative, your best friend your, in, in a short time then, because you know people are so busy with their own lives and it's hard to transport from, to move from one place to another. You realize that Palau is the best place. It's not too small, it's not too big, it's just the right as long as you use it in a right way that you do not uh, overuse it and abuse it. Do you see similarities in the cultures between Palau and, and say Hawaii? Yeah, I see uh, similarities like the food in culture, like the taro and fish. The community is not just like we just all get together for customs. We get together for work, like for example the taro patches right here. These are much different tar looking taro than... These are the elephant uh, ear taro. They're yellow in color. The root, that's the crop that we eat. And uh, there's uh, like a water running in the middle between the taro patches and the forest and stuff. 
communities get together and clean those waterways in the that's part of community the community get together and work on the street I see like you know we're all Pacific Islanders they we always share together we always uh, when we have like we go fishing we come back and then we share your fish with your neighbors with your and with your relatives we have we don't have lemon you go out to the neighbor and ask for lemon fruits from their lemon tree I see it in the places that I've been to but I've been lucky with from my work that I through my job I travel and that's when I see the the, the differences and the similarities and then that's when you have the appreciation that you have you're you're lucky your island is not uh, so overpopulated or you're lucky you have a small island you can reach out to that's uh, your friends and relatives in times of uh, uh, need or when they need you they in just a short time everybody gets together not like traveling by by bus or traveling by airplane let's not forget that we have been ruled by other bigger countries and uh, and so we have uh, adopted some, a lot of things into our culture but we have never lost the, the real basic culture of being a Palawan for example the the first childbirth ceremony the funeral funeral is a big event in Palau uh, house buying ceremony for a relative and that kind of brings everybody much more closer because they they know that all their relatives love them that's why they got together to provide them with some more assistance in all of those things it seems like coming together and sharing that you care about your relatives and mm. your your neighbors is, is really an important part of those customs mm. yeah they are very important because you know we just uh, in a way we're all we're all related I can trace my lineage to my neighbor so it's been good it's been good I've learned a lot and uh, uh, I appreciate the PCS for helping me uh, learn how to do what I'm doing right now I do environmental education Yalop drove me from our hotel in Karor, across the bridge, to the northeastern coast of Babaldab Island. This bridge is a pretty special bridge. Is, is this the one that is uh, of a certain design? Yeah, it was, um, well, it's like a single span, longest, it was single, longest single span bridge in the world, but now it's not. <laughs> and it collapsed into, in 1996. And uh, it was a little bit heavier. After 20 years, it collapsed. So now it's a little bit thinner, and they, it's got the uh, suspended suspended cables. Uh -huh. So it's holding it up. So it's nice. And now it's called. It used to be called the Koror Bubble Dao Bridge. Now it's the Palau Japan Friendship Bridge. Oh. It's J J Japan paid for the bridge and also the road, but they want the. Uh, fishing rights from from the country from Palau, so they give us this, and then they need our fishing right. They they want to come in and fish in our waters. So. And have you let them? Uh, yes, I think so, because all these mm -hmm. millions of us. <laughs> million because you need the bridge, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You want we, when we come back, we can stop by at the capital. Have you? Uh -huh. I would like to stop by the capital. I've Last not seen time it. you were here, it is not. It was oh, not. Oh yeah, even the road was yet. not. Yeah. Okay. Why did they choose to put the capital in? It's Melekok or how? Melekok, because it was in the constitution, in our constitution, that the Melekok has to, uh, the capital has to be in the, in Babel uh -huh. Because in Palau legend, Gremlungui is like the oldest of the Milad. Mm -hmm. and Milad is like the mother of all, of, of Palau. And then there's a 
Balakiok and Koror uh, uh, and uh, Ramlungu and uh, Aimeli, Aimeli was the only girl. And um, but then Malkiok was first the chief of Malkiok, uh, the Clive from Malkiok, uh, first offered land and that's how they got it. Everybody wanted the <laughs> national seat of the seat of the national government to be in their place. How come? Uh, uh, I guess they want politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, government is modeled right after the United States government. So we have a president, a vice president, and the cabinet the ministers under the president. And then there's the National Congress with uh, 13 senators and uh, 16 delegates. There's the Senate and then the House of Delegates. And then all the states have six uh, they have governors uh, uh -huh. and they have uh, their own legislatures uh, so there's the legislators and then among them is the speaker of the house of the state legislature how does the that system of government interface with um, the traditional Palauan um, uh, system right the traditional chiefs uh, serve as the uh, advisors to the president it's oh. in the constitution. So the the house of traditional chiefs, the uh, traditional leaders are are housed within the office of the government of the president. They're always involved with uh, everything, many issues, and and for now they are very much involved. They want to be involved with the uh, environment they always want uh, they always want to have people environment uh, talk to them about what's happening with the reefs and with the uh, uh, fish because there's so many uh, regulations with uh, from the environmental programs uh, and so they always want they're asking can you keep uh, can you give us uh, how, like fish stock for example uh -huh. or what's happening with uh, 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 climate change we know there's like people, climate change is a big issue, but we really don't know what's going on. So, which is good because most of the chiefs are, are old people, are old men, and uh, they want to be well informed. me a little bit about the Palau Conservation Society. You said it's a community-based organization. Right. So PCS is a, uh, it's a community-based organization. It started in 1994 and the Palau became independent in October on the same year. Their vision, they wanted to have this NGO as the uh, watchdog for the environment of Palau because there was when we became independent, we were like, Palau is being opened up to, to development, then which yes. is fine, but it has to be sustained. Uh -huh. And if we don't have this uh, watchdog, then, you know, things could go whatever the people want, in the people in, the, in high positions. So it's been good, we've been, um, doing well with the communities. Communities ha have been very receptive and uh, like the fishermen, for example, they're always asking like, so when is the open season for such and such fish? Uh, and, and we have, a, there's been a few uh, conservation education campaigns like uh, for the beep and the dugong and the uh, sea turtles uh, and it's been kind of like people have been asking like so when can we get turtles it's or, or they have changed their behavior uh -huh. and it's it doesn't take an overnight uh, uh, time to change people's behavior but we have right now a five-year moratorium for hawksbill turtle it was passed from the national congress and it was signed by the president in december 2010 so at the moment, uh, the moratorium is effective, and we're trying to do some uh, nesting survey for hawksbill turtles. Uh, uh, 
this came from the Wela Sali, the Turtles Are Our Friends uh, campaign, uh -huh. <laughs> if you remember. Yes. I guess we just finished it when you came to Palau the first time. And um, it's the people have, we don't see any more turtles lying on their back under trees at people's homes. Uh, so those are the changes that we have noticed. People are like, there's open and closed season, so people are, ask, are calling to ask like, when is open season? Or people have been calling in like, we have we found this dead turtle, this, this turtle stangled in a net in an island. So we document this uh, uh, with pictures and interview people, and there's this change that we see. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, we were afraid like, people are going to say, so who are you to tell us that to eat turtles? <laughs> and it was really true. Some people were like, uh, didn't like the campaign and then eventually they kind of understood. It sank down. Turtles, uh, especially hawksbill turtle, is very important to our culture because we use the uh, turtle scoots to mold into what we call toluk. And toluk are exchanged by women. It's like women's money in Palau. If somebody, a woman asks another woman to to plant taro in her taro pots, then she he, he pay her with the tolu. So with the moratorium on the fishing for the hawksbill turtles, how did the women um, get the important part of the turtle that they would use as their money? The tolu are circulating, so they, they do not get out of Palau because we cannot take them out of Palau because we get sighted just land outside of, like in Guam, the first uh, uh, United States soil, you get arrested for bringing in a turtle material for like $10,000. Uh, the Toluk in Palau are just circulating, so there's no need to make more. So the conservation areas might allow, be allowed to be fished at certain times or right. certain fish can be captured? Yes, it's not like total closure. There's like 47 conservation protected areas right now throughout Palau. The only total closed uh, preserve wildlife area is the Ngurungwi, the wildlife preserve. It's in the Rock Islands where it, uh, call it, uh, uh, another name for it is the 70 Islands. Uh -huh. And it's been closed since 1956. How did you get interested in, in working for the Palau Conservation Society? <laughs> That's a good question. I was working for, I was working in the tourism industry. I was a tour guide. I get in the boat every morning and take tourists to the rock islands and we go diving and snorkeling. And then as I was like, uh, like when I'm in the water or when I'm in, out in the field, I'm always interested in in nature, and I was like, "Wow, this is fascinating!" Because my background from school is like business management. Uh -huh. uh, then there was a vacancy in 2000 at the Palau Conservation Society, so I made a, a I applied, and then here I am. So <laughs> this is like my working on my 12th year. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College Program. Helping coastal communities of Hawaii and the Pacific. Through research, education, and outreach. Serving the community, from elementary to graduate students. Hawaii Sea Grant. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is the dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. The award-winning Fluid Earth and Living Ocean textbooks are now interactive and online. New activities, updated content, and a teacher community. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now freely available. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. 
find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Healthy oceans are critical to our cultural, economic, and environmental sustainability in Hawaii. The ocean serves as a source of water, food, medicine, jobs, transportation, recreation, and energy. It controls climate and weather. Kosi Island Earth aims to share this ocean awareness by partnering with local scientists and educators to engage communities and schools in active science learning for an ocean literate population. Kosi Island Earth is working to establish new avenues for connecting research scientists with educators and communities. Kosi Island Earth is enhancing the science and ocean literacy of our island residents and visitors. Kosi Island Earth is connecting scientific research, traditional knowledge, and ocean policy. Kosi Island Earth, bringing together university, government, research, and community partners to improve science education and ocean stewardship in Hawaii.